All right, what's up, everybody? NBA playoffs, 2017, second round. Uh, two games, two games to break down. The uh, first one, Wizards and Celtics. Technically, was the second game of the day. Uh, I'm going to get right into it. Right after the 2-0 series lead, I sent out a tweet saying John Wall is the best point guard in the East. Took me a while to come around to that. Very obvious. But I don't think it wasn't until these playoffs that he really took the next step. Uh, credit to Scotty Brooks. This was something that when they signed Scotty Brooks to be their head coach, it seemed like it was going to have a drastic effect on those who just needed slightly more development. You can't ever forget. Russell Westbrook, James Harden, Kevin Durant, regardless how talented they are and how skilled they are outside of Scott Brooks' original system, he had a tremendous impact on what how they developed. Uh, Serge Ibaka had a place in Scotty Brooks' system for Oklahoma City. And now, you watch as it starts to happen at their home court, I mean on their home court, they are still an incredibly difficult team to beat. So I sent out the tweet that he's the best point guard in the East, even if he were to lose in the second round. That wasn't a death sentence tweet to the Wizards, hence why I immediately also said I can easily see this being 2-2 coming back to Boston. It was more just to put it into uh, context. It doesn't matter win or lose the series. Best point guard in the East very much belongs to John Wall overall. Just all around better point guard, I think, than uh, Isaiah Thomas and Kyrie Irving. I would say that Isaiah Thomas and Kyrie Irving are better probably at scoring, but not by much. Uh, whereas passing, I don't even think uh, you need to just check the highlight tape from today's game. Check the highlight tape from any playoff game that John Wall has been in this season. It's pretty phenomenal up there uh, in terms of Eastern Conference uh, dominance. So the, uh, the the Celtics fall to the Wizards um, after a 26-0 third quarter run that looked terrifying to play against. And how they did that was the Celtics kept trying to push the pace on offense even though it wasn't working in the earlier stages of that run. The Wizards locked down defensively and found ways to interrupt passing lanes on defense and then turn those into immediate points, and we're talking like four seconds or less points. Uh, John Wall gets up and down the court faster than everybody else in the league with the ball in his hand. That we already knew. But you look at some of the players around him. Bradley Beal on the catch-and-shoot was nothing short of phenomenal, and he had multiple instances where he was uh, getting into those positions to be in a catch-and-shoot. So credit to, to um, Bradley Beal for... For being in the right place at the right time, I just want to pull up, of course, there's always the box score, which, of course, always I can't find. Um, the Celtics couldn't get anything going offensively, and the way that they get their offense moving really is through defense. I mean, we saw it happen with Avery Bradley one-on-one, -on -one, as Andre Snellings was pointing out earlier uh, today on his, or not just today, but the other day in his article, when Avery Bradley locks down defensively. And it, it, it really turns the engine that is the Celtics offense, especially when they're trying to push the tempo. It usually starts with a stolen pass or an interrupted passing lane or a, a, a far-off defensive rebound that can get them set up quickly to push the pace down the court. Uh, John Wall didn't finish great from the field, but he was 9 of 9 from the free throw line and added 12 assists on top of 5 steals to his match. Uh, his game, I should say, again, you want to look at the most important statistic when it comes to the playoffs. It will always be plus minus, no matter what, uh, and guys like John Wall were plus 25, Porter and Gortat were plus 34, uh, Gortat was plus 34, and he only had 6.7 rebounds and 3 assists, now, that's not otherworldly, but it just shows that the 26 minutes he was on the court, he was fundamental in pushing, uh, that, that, I don't want to say necessarily the offense, but he was just fundamental in being in the right place at the right time. And uh, lastly, Boston, you know, Isaiah Thomas and Al Horford. Al Horford looked okay on the glass early in the first half and was fighting for rebounds and then got bullied away from it. And when teams like the Wizards can win the rebounding battle against the Celtics, which I think they did handedly, 45-31, to 31, um, it's tough for the Celtics to win basketball games. So we go back to Boston. I'm going to say that the Celtics take Game 5 in Boston. They'll have an answer. And then I think they'll be back in Washington where the Wizards will take Game 6. 
And then I think at that point, Game 7 is completely up in the air. I think everything changes. I think Boston has the slight advantage because they're at home. But it just depends on if you get these kind of performances from John Wall, it's going to be impossible to stop, or at least close to impossible to stop. Again, almost every game this series, save for this one, the Wizards jump out to massive early leads. This time, it took the third quarter for that run to happen. Usually it happens early in the first quarter. So it should be interesting to see what goes on going forward. Uh, outside of that, I'm shooting this as the Houston Rockets are ahead of the Spurs, 41-35, to 35, and I'm going to get to one note at the end of this clip to kind of the, the the media, the sports media that annoys me uh, all the time. LeBron has uh, had 35-9-6 and six, and had 11-22 of 22, uh, shooting, so he saw it 50% or better again. Uh, Kyrie Irving plus 14, 27 points and 9 assists, and put together a hell of a good game. Kyle Lowry was out. He was injured. Uh, pretty much could have felt that this was going to go the Cavaliers' way instead of a gentleman's sweep once Kyle, Kyle Lowry was listed out. The Raptors did fight back. Corey Joseph had, Joseph had the best game of his season, uh, especially at home, but against the defending champions, and, and if not first, second best team in the NBA. Um, so... Numbers aside, it was a good fight at the end for the Raptors, but they were overmatched. They were overmatched uh, even more so than they were last year. And last year, I don't think they necessarily had a better team. I think that the Cavaliers are better than they were last year. Kyle Korver as a specialist is terrifying. Kyle Korver, uh, 18.6 of eight shooting. Again, they found a way. Once they unlock that key into having an extra additional man, especially a bench player like Korver has been as a sixth man in a way, to find uh, those open three-point shots, he's one of the best three-point shooters in NBA history. He's going to be one of the best, at least statistically. So once they found that, they used it to their advantage. In the last two games, they took specialists to a new level, and while it might not be a, an absurd amount of scoring, 18 points and five boards out of 29 minutes, out of Kyle Korver is exactly what you signed him for. So again, another scary piece to the Cavs uh, puzzle. So first of two notes to kind of finish this up on. Uh, for one, LeBron James' playoff numbers. We got to take a step back as a whole and recognize that since game four of NBA Finals last year, so starting with game five, LeBron James has not lost a playoff game. Uh, the Cavaliers have not lost a game in the first or second round of the playoffs in now two straight years. I think that's the first player to ever go 8 0 two straight years. And no, it's not because the East is that much worse than the West. Uh, the Cavs would have swept the Blazers. The Cavs would have swept the Jazz. The Cavs would have swept the the likes, the, I mean the Grizzlies, maybe not five games. They have a little bit more talent top to bottom. But let's not pretend that the East is this terrible thing. It was better than, it was better this year than it was last year, and last year was better that year than it was the year before. Players do not want to play in the same conference as LeBron James. Uh, 34 points. This is playoff numbers this year. 34.3 points, 9.0 rebounds, 7.5 assists. He leads with 2.4 steals, and he's shooting an absolutely ridiculous 56.6%. It's his best numbers by far, including when he was carrying the 7 8 team, where he had 35.3 points. It actually was slightly better, but when he had 35.3 points, he was shooting uh, 51% opposed to 56%. I'll take one point less per game and add on much better shooting percentage and call it better numbers. He also has more steals, more blocks. His I can't imagine what his box plus minus is, but the numbers alone are astronomical. They are better than Michael Jordan's numbers. Dor uh, his it, it, they're up there with Michael Jordan's best ever, but all around it is it is astounding. We need to recognize that. Um, I got to wrap up the clip. The last thing I wanted to say because this is my startup disc is almost full, I'm running out of space. Uh, the last thing I wanted to say was the uh, the media. I don't like how uh, certain big pundits, uh, even the ones I like, like Nick Wright, uh, make it out to seem like Kawhi Leonard's a bad basketball player. And I, I know Nick Wright knows that Kawhi Leonard is one of the 10, 5 to 10 best players in the league. Um, but just because he doesn't do what LeBron does, he doesn't do at times what Kevin Durant can do, um, and vice versa. And Durant doesn't do what Kawhi does, or Kawhi doesn't do what, or Kawhi does what LeBron sometimes can't do, I guess, in certain uh, instances. They make it seem like they are bad at basketball. They make it seem like they don't like that player. I try to avoid that. Um, I try to criticize players when they have either a bad game but not take it against the whole series. And I recognize the fact that even Kevin Durant in his worst game, LeBron in his worst game, Kawhi in his worst game, uh, Westbrook, Harden, these guys in their worst games are still all-around top-tier talents. 
And I don't want to ever make it seem like, well, Kawhi had a bad game, that means he's a bad player. I don't, that, I don't think ever want that to be a correlation. Um, and it's not just Nick Wright, Skip Bayless, and these mainstream guys that do it partly for ratings when you know that they have their justifications if they're not so justifi- justified, at least in my opinion. Uh, I think Nick Wright's better than most, and I defend him a lot because he brings an argument to the table opposed to just no clutch gene or fake whatever statistic they need to show to prove maybe that that player isn't as good but just keep an open mind with these kind of things i guess going forward i think i'm literally out of space so we'll see you next time we'll be in studio tomorrow rocket spurs an ever important game gonna go back and watch that and then uh go to bed (laughs) peace guys